René Descartes at the court of Queen Christina of Sweden. When Descartes went to Sweden in 1649, he was 53 years old and well established as a philosopher, scientist and mathematician. He was known throughout Europe and his writings were widely read. In the history of mathematics, Descartes has a principal role to play, as we'll see shortly. But standing behind Descartes in this purely imaginary group scene is a figure who arguably is central to the development of scientific and mathematical thinking in the early part of the 17th century. His name is Marin Mersenne. We start our story in Paris in the 1630s. Mersenne is a friar in the Minimite convent of the Annunciation. The Minimites, as the name implies, are a relatively small and humble order. But they have built for themselves a reputation for scientific investigation, with Mersenne amongst their most celebrated experimenters. Celebranos amalo. Amen. Massen himself made a study of the nature of sound. His love of music made this a natural choice for his inquiring mind. But it was a subject not much studied at that time, and Massen was one of the first to do so. He discovered, by experiment, that the pitch of a plucked string is affected by several factors. First, it was proportional to the square root of the tension. Secondly, it was inversely proportional to the length. Thirdly, it was also inversely proportional to the square of the diameter. This formula was Mersenne's own discovery. It was completely new, and actually contrary to the accepted Pythagorean view of the relationship between tension and pitch. But Mersenne wasn't content with just an experimental determination of this relationship. Why should this law hold? How can I prove mechanically that this law must hold true? I know that it is true to within the limited precision of my experimental observations. But can this formula be proved with the certitude of a mathematical explanation? The tension governs the movement of the string. But what is the nature of this movement? I have determined, using very long strings that vibrate very slowly, the manner in which the string behaves. But what are the physical laws that determine the manner of this vibration and relate it to the tension? And what are the harmonics of a plucked string? Without changing the length or the tension or any physical aspect, I can cause the string to behave differently. And produce notes of several different pitches. Now this I find puzzling enough, but I have listened deeply to many notes. And I have determined that plucking an open string can produce as many as five different tones at the same time. This constant questioning of phenomena is characteristic of Mersenne's work. During his lifetime, he performed experiments in sound, optics, heat, hydraulics, ballistics, and much more. And Mersenne didn't keep his work to himself. He meticulously wrote up his researches in books and letters. Indeed, his letters alone run into thousands of pages and are at least as important as his books. For Mersenne chose his correspondence carefully, passing on questions and results to all the most capable people of his day. It was said that to inform Mersenne of a discovery meant to publish it throughout the whole of Europe. For Mersenne had a mission. It is my role to be an instigator to create problems, to provoke quarrels even among the scholars. And out of this, the truth must emerge. Intellectual collaboration is a duty. 
Unfortunately, scholars are stubborn, often selfish people. To their disgrace, they will not share their discoveries. I myself have scrupulously followed the rules which I have proposed and promoted science in all places. I have posed problems always with the idea that others may work in collaboration to resolve them. I have recounted my experiences and experiments in the minutest detail so that others may take them up and, if possible, improve upon them still further. Thus it is with a certain impatience that I strive to form a truly international academy of science. Time is pressing. Good opportunities are being let slip. This century has produced many good minds which are capable of adding to the sciences and may be capable of reforming them in many ways. If only they would be more open with the results of their researches. Typical of many scholars of the day was the secretive Roberval. Roberval became professor of mathematics at the Collège de France in Paris in 1632, a post he held for the rest of his life. One reason for his secrecy, and why he didn't publish many of his results, was the fact that he had to compete for his post every three years. So his original methods he kept to himself. A famous problem of the time on which Roberval worked concerned the nature of the curve called a cycloid. A cycloid is formed by following a point on the circumference of a rolling circle. It's an elegant curve and was often used by architects. This is the Ponte di Mezzo in Pisa. Built by pupils of Galileo, it has cycloidal arches. But despite the elegance of the cycloid, little was known of its properties. For example, could it be that one of its arches was no more than half an ellipse? Another outstanding problem was to find the area under a cycloid. To solve this problem, Roberval cleverly exploited a technique using indivisibles. First, he considers only half the cycloid. He now sets about finding this area. This curve is generated by half a revolution of a circle. So Roberval divides the generating circle in half. What he's going to do next is subtract the area of the semicircle from the cycloid. The indivisible concept of area means considering the area of the semicircle as if made up of horizontal parallel lines. To subtract the area of the semicircle, each line is moved parallel to itself inside the half cycloid. The area of the half cycloid is now divided into two parts. The shaded part is equal to the area of the semicircle, that's a half pi r squared. Now Roberval has to find this area. By another clever indivisible argument, he shows that if you take a copy of this shape and turn it over, then it fits exactly with the original to form a rectangle. The area of this rectangle is easy to work out. Its height is the diameter of the generating circle, and its width is half the circumference of the circle. So the area of the rectangle is 2 pi r squared. So the area of half of the rectangle is pi r squared. That gives the area under half an arch of the cycloid to be a half pi r squared plus pi r squared, which is 3 over 2 pi r squared. So the area under one arch of the cycloid is twice this. That's 3 pi r squared. In other words, the area under one arch of the cycloid is three times the area of the generating circle. Roberval had many ingenious methods like this for solving problems on areas of curves and for finding tangents, but alas, he kept them secret. Massenne worked hard to break the secrecy and isolation of scholars of the time. 
In addition to the huge correspondence he maintained, he also formed and attended gatherings in and around Paris of scholars and scientists. But of all the scholars, it was the mathematicians that Mersenne regarded most highly. In 1635, he writes to Piresque about one of his scholarly groups. I have been assured that we shall have Monsieur Gassendi here at the beginning of June. I am very pleased about this. He will see the most noble academy in the world, which has recently been formed in this town. It no doubt will be the most noble, for it is wholly mathematical. As for the names of the most excellent gentlemen who attend, they are Messieurs Etienne Pascal, Midorge, Hardy, Robéval, Desargues, the Abbé Chambon, and others. My good friend René Descartes does not attend. He will not commit himself to any group and is contemptuous of our ideals. But I continue to correspond with him and he with us. Thus Mersenne created and became the centre of a scientific community that stretched the length and breadth of Europe. Mersenne, however, was not to see his ideals of international academies come into being in his own lifetime. But shortly after his death, the French Academy of Sciences came into existence, with many of Mersenne's circle of correspondents, including those from countries other than France, among its early members. However, one of the most important mathematical advances of the century was to come from the pen of René Descartes. Descartes had been studying mathematics for some time, when, in 1631, he tackled the solution of a classical Greek problem. He proudly boasted that he solved it in five or six weeks. But it wasn't so much the problem itself that was important, but the entirely novel method of solution. What Descartes did was to set up the foundations of the system which we use today for the examination of curves and graphs, and which bears his name, Cartesian geometry. The problem tackled by Descartes is known today as Pappus' problem. We start with four fixed straight lines. From a point C, distances are measured to these lines 